and health near and dear to our hearts, and in particular with an emphasis on health disparities, which of course are prevalent in any urban environment, which you saw in Boston and we have here in DC, that compounds, excuse me, the work compounds the, the risk and also the barriers to, to doing the work that she does. So we're really excited to hear how she's forged uh -huh. her way through those barriers and um, opening up opportunities, I'm sure, by getting to know each other for collaborative work. Thank Great. you so much for being here. Thank you, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming um, at lunchtime. Don't make me hungry. Um, <laughs> I love food. Uh, so I'm uh, really happy to be here today to talk really about um, where I started with um, more clinically based work and how I evolved to using uh, the community as my, not petri dish, but you know, my clinic per se. Um, I have done petri dishes too, right Matt, so um, that all works. Um, but really the work and how um, I love to do both um, physical activity and nutrition work and my feeling on always trying to do one over the other and I feel like physical activity is always a little bit behind but nutrition is always at the forefront but you know, my kind of constant, constant battles um, over time. And um, really how I got into this work was um, really an interest, not only obviously in um, energy balance with diet and physical activity, but it was all about obesity prevention. And clearly, I'm sure here too, as many of you work with um, child obesity work, um, prevention and or treatment. And you know, I like to look at it as a balanced approach. And again, but with research, we can't always follow um, sort of, we have to follow the funding lines, and that's what I kind of talk about, not necessarily like always our big passions, but really always trying to do this work hand in hand. And I did come from the Friedman School of Nutrition at Tufts. So for 13 years I was there, and it was a lot about what you eat, so I think that's why I was a little rebellious about always trying to keep my physical activity, my exercise science background at the forefront. But everyone will tell you different things about what to eat. I know I'm not talking to a bunch of nutrition professionals here, um, but we all have our opinions. And um, you know, we could, we could argue about coffee or wine or cheese or any of those things, and someone will always be right depending on what research they cite. Um, but you know, that's one thing to think about. But I like I, I really ask all of you to kind of think about this um, as you progress your life because it is important, obviously. But how much do you move? I think people think about that a little bit less. And I, you know, everybody has an opinion about diet. Um, physical activity, and that's why I say it falls a little bit behind because most of us aren't thinking about how much we move on a daily basis, and I'm pretty passionate about this work. Um, but really looking at this sort of, you know, the dose response stimulus of how much you move and you sort of the health responses and the benefits to that. And the physical activity guidelines for Americans really sets the stage for that. And thinking about yourself even today, right now you're sitting, but how much time you spend lying down versus sitting versus standing, light intensity, moderate intensity, and vigorous intensity exercise or physical activity really has a differential effect on our health outcomes. And we know now a lot about sedentary time, very different than the impact on moderate to vigorous activity. So keep that in mind as well. But I also at this time ask you <clears throat> to think about how much you move throughout the day along with what you're kind of eating. Um, of course, we are surrounded by the highly processed and packaged foods. Um, processed foods is a hot topic right now. I just had a doctoral student finish her dissertation work on definitions of processed foods. Still very controversial, but you know we, we do eat, um, I'd say about, I think calorically, 70% of our calories, most Americans come from this type of food. Not all of us is bad, um, but you know, along those lines. And similarly, we do have a physical activity problem, and I'm sure you're all aware. Physical activity guidelines for Americans recommend that children engage in 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity per day. This was objectively measured, um, and this is still the best representation of um, how much activity kids are getting. If you look at six to 11 year old kids already, less than half the kids are meeting that recommendation, and you see a disparity there, a significant one, which I'll talk about again later, by sex. And then once you get to those adolescent years, it really plummets. And then if you look at adults on the far right, the recommendation is 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous per week. So you can call it, you know, generously at 30 minutes per day. Less than 5% of adults meet that recommendation. So really staggering statistic and really, you know, calling, um, you know, alarm on both sides of the energy balance equation. We have dietary issues, but we also have movement issues. And I think a lot of us, especially straddling a department that's nutrition and exercise science, which one is superior in terms of health impact? And I'd like to argue that it's, you know, really both. Um, but thinking about that um, as we go through the talk today. Um, 
um, for this work, um, you know, I was compelled by obesity prevention um, and, you know, into that field right when people started to talk about it, but also noticing it in my communities. Um, I was working in a laboratory, really looking a lot about muscle health, um, looking at a lot of molecular biology, and I was like, you know, I really want to get back in the community and look at what's happening with kids. And it was a big transition in my career. And uh, one of my very early studies when I was transitioning back to an assistant professor was looking at, um, you know, kids who were overweight or obese. And my whole mantra was, okay, diet is very important, but yeah, you know, it's like, look, if a kid can be fit in an overweight body, we call it so that, you know, that's basically being fit and fat, not PC, of course, um, but, you know, how would that really impact cardiometabolic health? And I know somebody who's done this work here, but really going into the community, I don't know how many of you have ever done a fitness test in schools, a pacer test or a shuttle run. You know, like PE teachers run it. I really wanted to look at, in a large community-based study, um, you know, really looking at associations, how a fitness test among kids, so a low-income community, um, could really be, you know, how that impacts your basic, basic cardiometabolic risk. And we can see this sample of fourth eighth graders, and again, this is not in a clinic, um, really should be healthy kids. Again, this was around, you know, 2009, 2010, when, you know, the BC epidemic was just kind of coming to the forefront. And we saw that 45% of kids had one or more blood lipids outside the recommended range. And that was the recommended range at that time. Um, so you look at cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL, and LDL. And even CRP, C-reactive protein, that inflammatory biomarker, was detectable in the majority of the kids. So that was a little bit, um, you know, I think shocking to us. Um, and then we wanted to look at how did that relate to this fitness test in school and how that also relates to relative overweight and obesity levels in, this, in these kids. And um, if you look at the children stratified by that, and again, these were just associational studies. If you look at fitness, and this is whether a kid by a PE teacher, so very, you know, I say rough, you know, we didn't go in as researchers say, this is how you have to execute the test and we controlled it. PE teachers and, you know, these populations just go out there and they try to do the best they can. Um, about half the kids passed um, were fit, considered fit in this cardiovascular test, but half were unfit. And what we see here is you can see it's just basically where you have to, you know, significant elevations of triglycerides and uh, lower levels of HDL in the fit versus unfit kids. And similarly, you see the same thing by weight status, right? So clearly, an, an overweight or obese child is more likely to have a suboptimal blood lipid, but it's also similar for an unfit child. And this was sort of, at the time, you're like, wow, like that fitness test actually meant something biologically. Um, and clearly, there's going to be unfit kids who are also compounded by, just by virtue of being overweight or obese. You're more likely to be unfit if you're overweight or obese. So if you put these categories together, and a lot of work had been done in adults at this time, you know, what happens, again, if you stratify into those groups that are the un-PC terms of the fit and fat, the ideal scenario, obviously, is you want kids to fall into the, the fit and not fat, right? Um, so if you look at these three um, graphs here, there's one for HDL, one for triglycerides, and one for C-reactive protein. I had personally hoped that you could have a, basically, a fit and fat kid be just as good as a fit and not fat, right? I wanted that fitness to sort of trump the fatness, because in my mind, if, you know, we're not going to make kids lean and skinny overnight, not that skinny is healthy, but if we can get them fit, we're, they're better off metabolically, right? But we didn't really see that relationship, unfortunately. But what we did see, um, if you look over here on the far right, is the not fit and fat, so the, really the kids that, you know, had the, um, the least optimal, you know, sort of phenotype, so they're not passing their fitness test and they're also overweight or obese, they basically have a compounded effect. You don't see this in kids in these other groups, but when they have both together, especially look at CRP and triglycerides, it's a compounded effect. The other groups do not have that. So having both of those scenarios together in a child was really manifesting itself in a negative biological outcome. So I found this quite compelling, um, and it really, you know, at the time, again, really interested in cardiometabolic health and how we can sort of, you know, overcome that with fitness. And of course, diet plays a huge role, and we had separate dietary work done on this study. But what I do want to point out is here I was in this sort of physical activity, fitness sort of, you know, mindset. Like, I want to look at this in relationship to the BCO epidemic. Is around the same time that vitamin D was sort of all the rage. It was the new it vitamin. I don't know if any of you have worked on vitamin D, but it was related to everything, right? Asthma, you know, immune status, cardiometabolic risk, diabetes, um, let alone bone health and muscle health. So everybody's like, you have extra archive neoplasma serum. Why don't you look at vitamin D status in these kids? Um, 
the, these kids were measured in uh, basically November through February, just by, by happenstance. Um, in New England, and we had a large percent that were overweight or obese, all things that sort of compound the risk, the potential risk for being vitamin D deficient. And we found that 75% of them were vitamin D deficient or insufficient, depending on the definition that you go by. So this was also equally shocking. Here we go into the schools and we we're finding these biological health you know, outcomes. And yes, we did take blood draws in the schools, which was you know, another, another big issue, but we got away with it um, without any kids. The first kid screamed and the rest were pretty good. Um, always the first kid, right? It makes you want to quit. Um, but your job, you're like, I'm going to do something else. But if, when you find something like this, you're like, what do I do with this? Vitamin D is one of those vitamins. You can't say, ugh. You know, go eat your fruits and vegetables, grow fruits and fruit and vegetable campaign. It's something that is very found in very low quantities um, in children's diets. Um, and it's also very hard to consume adequate levels, even if you're drinking milk and eating salmon and all those wonderful things that do have vitamin D. So we this is where nutrition again comes to the forefront. We have a simple nutrient, we're like, you know what, we have to do something about this. We have to probably put in a big grant and see what's going on in these children, even though I've sort of on this tide of wanting to follow fitness in kids. Um, and that really resulted in a large um, randomized controlled trial called the Daily D Health Study. And again, you know, not necessarily wanting to study a, a vitamin per se, but the whole diet, whole health, um, but we found that this specific nutrient obviously can have huge negative health impacts in kids. Um, you're starting to see a resurgence of rickets even in children these days because of basically not consuming enough vitamin D lack of sun exposure. If they are exposed to sun, their parents are slathering on a lot of, you know, sunscreen. Um, and kids are sitting inside. So those things alone are really, you know, sort of turning things. People say, oh, what if my kids live in Georgia? Like still, if you're not, you know, getting enough sun exposure across the year, you're going to be at risk for vitamin D deficiency. And I don't know how many of you have had your vitamin D levels taken, but really even here, you know, you're probably not getting a lot of synthesis from the sun between November and March. So up in New England is that you're definitely not getting any sun, any synthesis of vitamin D in your skin, even if you, even if you lay outside naked on a ski slope in December, like in a sunny day, you will not synthesize any vitamin D. So everybody's like, oh, I'm getting my vitamin D, it's sunny out, not in the winter. So it's a real, real issue. And then obesity, I think many of you might be aware that adipose tissue um, is thought to sequester vitamin D, so an overweight obese child is even more at risk. So when you look at low-income populations with a lot of health disparities, very at risk. And then on top of that, if the darker skin color you have, the less likely you are to synthesize vitamin D. So you can see across populations, it becomes a very fascinating thing to study. Um, so this trial did occur in Boston area urban school children. And we basically you know, could not randomize kids to a diet, but we figured we had to do a supplement because they were already at insufficient or deficient levels just in the general population. Again, not in the clinical population. And also at the time, when we submitted the grant, the RDA was 400 IUs per day. And we got funded, and they just upped the recommendation to 600 IUs. So we um, randomized, decided not to have a controlled condition in the study, only because most of the kids were already deficient or insufficient, and it would be unethical not to have a control situation. So the 600 IUs per day, that baseline level, um, we figured we'd serve almost as a control. But we wanted to see what would it take to get those kids up to sufficiency, 1,000 IUs per day or 2,000 IUs per day, would that get them above basically deficient levels? And then in turn, how would that impact cardiovascular risk? So completely off the fitness wagon now and physical activity, we threw in some measures, but um, the focus you know, shifted to nutrition. Fourth grade children and youth, it was all done in Boston area urban schools. We had intended this study to have happen at health clinics um, across the Boston area. We had our collaborators in place, and then we just found out that it was actually a lot easier for kids to be recruited in schools, do assessments in schools, and in a lot of low-income schools, they are, parents are relying on the schools for a lot of health information, access. I had one superintendent tell me, you know, kids get dental screenings at school. These parents are strapped for time. They're not going to go to a clinic for multiple visits, do it in the school. So we were doing blood draws and giving out pills, if you can imagine, chewable vitamin D tablets in the school setting. Um, and then the measures were at baseline, three, six, and 12 months. So kids were randomized to one of these three conditions over a one-month trial period. And we had blood draws, height and weight. We did skin color assessments. We did food frequency questionnaires, physical activity questionnaires. 
um, parent questionnaires, we control for puberty, all those wonderful things that you have to deal with kids in schools that made it very difficult. Um, and I'd say probably the one study that I would never want to do again, even though it went really well, because it was very stressful on a daily basis. Um, here you can see the enrollment. Um, we randomized subjects at baseline about 685 kids. Um, you know, basically equal distribution, um, about a little over 220 or 25 per group at 600, um, 1,000, and 2,000 IUs per day. And we were very fortunate to have an equal at follow-up, an, an analytic sample, there was just over 200 per group. So we had, very, in a very low-income population, high level of uh, diversity, pretty high level of retention in this study. Um, it, was, it was pretty remarkable. And I gotta say, like, if you make a, a vitamin D supplement that's a great flavor chewable, the kids actually like it. Um, and that's, again, where you engage kids to work on these studies. Um, we had focus groups with kids to see what kind of pill would they actually take? How big could it be? What it taste like? Do you want cherry or grape? Or, you know, we did all these things to make sure that kids would stay in the study. Enjoy it. Um, and this was the, the baseline characteristics of the study participants. It's hard to see, but I just want to point out that we had about 40% that were um, non-Hispanic white, um, just over, you know, I'd say 13 to 14% um, black African American, and about uh, 20 to 25% um, Latino. So a really diverse population. I was also extremely proud um, that we had about 10% Asian population. Um, the top where I worked in Boston was in Chinatown, and I learned that that population there does not like blood, blood draws, but I was so, so proud to have Asians in this population because I also had an Asian doctoral student at the time. And we basically, there's very little where you see that group in this type of study. So we were really happy also for skin color, you know, to look at that relationship was really, really interesting and in how these different subgroups actually respond to supplementation. Um, obese, overweight and obese kids, we had a nice, um, you know, again, mix. We had, you know, just a little over a third that were obese. So, again, a very high um, level of overweight obesity. And these were the groups that were really, you know, interested in looking at how did they respond, racial ethnic groups, but also overweight and obese um, kids and how they responded to supplementation. Again, what does it take to get these kids up to sufficient levels? And I don't know if I'll ever see this again in my career, um, but this is a beautiful dose response um, chart of our findings. Um, the first amazing thing is, is that the kids actually took the pills. Uh, so you always hope for compliance. I think for any um, randomized control trial, you're just hoping that your intervention actually is you know, taken up. And then whether it's effective is a whole other thing. But here you can see um, the squares, the dotted line is 600 OEs per day. Uh, the circle, the dash lines are 1,000 IUs a day, and the, the, the followed lines are 2,000 IUs a day. And all the kids started, you know, deficiency is around 20 nanograms per mil. Kids started around 21 or 22 nanograms per mil, so hovering right around deficiency. Um, and then three months in, you can see that the 600 1,000 IUs went up. You know, they are not to what was considered, you know, 30 nanograms per mil is considered optimal and some would consider it sufficient. Again, this is an argument in the vitamin D, um, you know, scientific literature. Um, but you're not getting up to that optimal level with the 6,000 or, or 1,000 IUs per day, but you are with the 2,000 IUs a day. And you can reach that pretty quickly by three months. Six months into the intervention, um, you can see that they basically are, let's see here. Going there, go up, sorry, go back. Um, they're staying about steady, so basically you reach a plateau. So you know that if you're a physician, you're working with someone who's deficient, basically three months of supplementation will get them up there, especially on the 2,000 IV per day. Safely, we had you know, obviously other biomarkers that we looked at for safety, and that was fine. And six months of here, and this is actually where they went off the supplementation, because we also wanted to figure, find out what happens when they stop, you know, taking vitamin D, and how long does it take it to get back down to baseline. And interestingly enough, 12 months out, so six months post-supplementation, where they're not taking anything, um, they did not return to baseline yet at that level. It's a fat-soluble vitamin, but we thought we'd actually see it return a little quicker. Um, again, it's hard to say what's going on here, but it's just information um, to know that you're not going to just pull it back down. Really, the turnover should be within, you know, four to six weeks, but it seems to be a little bit longer in these kids. So a really clean dose response um, and great to see. So again, it really is, you know, what dictates, you know, where you want to be, what you supplement someone with, and I'm not a supplement person per se, 
But, you know, if, you're, if you think, if you would argue that health effects are optimized around 25 nanograms per mil, 600 IUs for kids would be fine. But if you think that health outcomes would be optimal at, thir you know, basically 30, then you'd want to supplement with 2,000 IUs. So, again, it's how in relationship to what health outcome, bone or is it something else like cardiovascular disease risk, so, and which we also looked at. And I also want to point out, if you look at sort of what happens to the different brackets, so sufficient above 30, insufficient being 20 to 29 nanograms per mil, and looking at baseline, you can see here, but I really want to point out the dark bar, so deficiency or severe deficiency, so under that 20 nanograms per mil. At baseline, you can see the kids that were here. Um, if you look at 6,000, 1,000, or 2,000, you basically get rid of severe deficiency at 2,000. There's almost no kids left at that at three and six months. You're still going to see at 6,000 and 1,000 IU some kids with severe deficiency. So again, if you have kids that are really low, you want to basically supplement with a higher dose. Um, so really titrated results here. And then looking at race ethnicity, um, completely messy graphs, but you have to like look at the you know, differential effects. And what I want to point out is this is 6,000 and 1,000 IUs, but on the far right, the 2,000 IUs a day. The interesting thing that we saw here, if you look at the Asian children, um, they are the triangles. They have the least responsiveness to the 2,000 IUs a day. And in conjunction with the, the black African-American kids, they started out with the lowest levels of vitamin D. The African-American children were very responsive to the 2,000 IUs a day compared to the Asian kids. So that's just some, you know, again, some different things going on with some things that we don't know why yet, um, you know, basic, you know, that are related to racial ethnic groups. And again, this is all controlled also for sun exposure. So some different things going on there as well. If you look in the, in the lower, basically in the lower, in the lower doses, you know, you have, if you look at the black children, they're not responding basically to the 600 IUs a day at all. So again, depending on who you're dealing with, um, definitely want to think about different doses. And same thing with weight status. Um, if you look at 2,000 IUs a day, you can see basically in your obese children, in the squares on the far right, they are not responding as well as um, the normal weight or overweight children. So again, it takes more for an obese child to respond to vitamin D supplementation. So all, again, really being sensitive to, you know, who you're dealing with and not sort of a, you know, a one dose fits all for the situation. And then finally, um, a paper that we're currently working on is finally the cardiometabolic risk outcomes and sort of those relationships. And some interesting things here, um, I'd say it's like the flip side, you know, the, the 600 IUs, um, there's a time effect. And what you see is the 600 IUs, if you look at HDL cholesterol, um, you know, this is through six months. You're benefiting the, you know, basically the least on the 2,000 IUs a day. And similarly, you say the same for LDL cholesterol. So it's a little bit messy in whether it's biologically relevant. There's something going on here, but I say it's not, if your outcome is really looking at blood lipids per se, it is not necessarily more beneficial to get, to, to get the 2,000 IUs in the system. But again, whether biological relevance is seen here, it's very small changes, um, but it is significant. So there are impacts on these lipids over time. So um, some food for thought there. So, you know, this again is, you know, it's one um, nutrient and, you know, one potential impact on health, but something that really in this type of work you fall upon it, you're like, I have to look at it because it's important um, and it gets you off track. But what I did learn in this work is that you can do a lot in schools. Um, and, you know, I was very compelled at this time, look, look, I want to prevent heart disease in kids. And, you know, schools started to get the notion in their head that, like, well, you know, we, we care about the kids' health, but that's, you know, when they're 40 or 50 or 60 or and that's not when they're here. Um, and it got more and more difficult for us to actually conduct work in the schools with time. Um, and I know we talked about that here in D.C. schools as well. Um, but something that was happening alongside this was that there was some legislation happening in Massachusetts um, that was going to actually tax sugar-sweet beverages and take that money to actually fund physical activity programs. I'm like, oh, well, that was back what I wanted to do. And, um, you know, I'm working in schools. So They're like, well, we need to know how active the kids are in schools. So I'm like, well, I'd love to look at physical activity and cardiovascular risk. And the schools are like, you know, but it's blood draws. We care about health. And I'm like, ah, oh, you know, I got to think about something else. And so I basically switched to the switcheroo, and I was like, you know, schools care about cognitive health and um, those outcomes. 
about. They care about, you know, teaching to the test. They care about behavior. Um, they clearly, you know, care if kids are present, you know, you know, the presenteeism. And if they're not healthy, in my mind, in a lot of different ways, they're not going to be present there to learn. So I was fortunate enough um, to sort of go into schools and be like, look, I want to look at activity levels in kids. Um, we've, we've shown, we've been really had this great relationship looking at cardiovascular health, um, and we had the buy-in at that point. And they're like, look, you're going to come back and do something that's not invasive. That's okay. I will let you in. And what was happening at that time was that schools are basically recommended to put 30 minutes of physical activity within a school day. And I'm like, okay, well, let's measure and see what that looks like in Boston area, urban, low-income school kids. Um, and if any of you know about schools, um, they get a little bit of recess and they get PE maybe once a week, sometimes twice, typically not every day unless you're really, really lucky. Um, and, that's, and most kids aren't moving that entire time. So this was a leap, but we wanted to see where kids were at. Um, and again, we went back into schools, had about 800 kids. Uh, these elementary school kids, I'm telling you, the third through sixth graders typically are awesome because they can sign up for a study, want to participate, and geek out on research, um, but not be too cool for the britches at that point. Um, so they're a lot of fun, and they're, you know, really good subjects. Um, but we went in and did seven days of accelerometry, uh, accelerometry on 800 kids. And this is basically, I think you guys know what an actograph belt looks like. There's no numbers, no flashing bells. Again, these kids are, a lot of them, really low income. This is not a priority in their families, but they are so good about wearing these and returning them. Um, and you can see here about third pre reduced price eligible. And this is a little bit more um, middle income than we typically work with. 30% uh, um, overweight obese and 75% Hispanic, non Hispanic white. So not as diverse as we've usually um, worked with. And I think what, you know, really got me going um, is looking at some disparities that we saw in school time physical activity and total daily activity. Again, this is going to fuel, hopefully, these data are going to fuel legislation. But if you look in school time, um, 21 minutes for boys, uh, 15 minutes for girls. Um, and if you look at the daily recommendations, it's supposed to be 60 minutes. And you can see about 63 minutes for boys and 38 for girls. So not meeting that 60 minute recommendation, not meet, about 15% meeting that. And then if you look here with a 30-minute recommendation in schools, about 8% of kids met that recommendation. So now I'm dealing with vitamin D deficient, overweight, obese, and non-moving kids. So it's very frustrating, but um, you know, we're trying to move the needle on this stuff. Um, so that was stressful, um, knowing that that's the data where we are, with the starting point that we're working at. Um, and then you look at the disparities by weight status. Clearly what we think, Although I thought it was surprising and in a good way that if you look at school time activity, normal weight and overweight kids are the same. So those overweight kids, if you can keep them from becoming obese, they're just as active as the normal weight, which is great. But, you know, again, obese kids in school and out of school time, again, not as active as their peers. And, of course, you know, are they moving as much because they're obese because it's harder for them or vice versa? You know, it's sort of like, you know, how can we sort of get them to move a little bit more um, and obviously just the, um, the social cultural um, biases that come with the weight stigma as well. So you can see those. And then we also saw within school, this is third, fourth, and fifth graders, you can see the subtle decline with age. Um, so this is pointing to, okay, the girls, I think, was a big thing that I didn't realize I would see, that there was going to be such a disparity at such a young age and activity in school when all kids were supposed to be treated equally. Um, but also the decline with age, which we guessed, right, we know by national data, but really you can see the subtle decline even within an elementary school. And then even more recently, we've done this work in D.C. public schools. Hannah Press, one of our graduate students, helped um, gather this data with me and other wonderful graduate students. And we're seeing this, again, in D.C. public schools. And you see this in already in first grade. Um, and even in pre-K, boys versus girls, that was not meeting that recommendation in the decline as you go through first, third, and fifth grade. And the dotted line, again, is uh, the, basically the recommendation. But what I want to point out here is the pre-K. Um, I started working in elderly populations in my dissertation. I worked my way backwards. Now I feel like I'm going to go to pre-K. Because they're actually recommended they move 60 minutes a day um, in school. In school. They're supposed to be moved actually more than that, 15 minutes every hour. Only about 1% of those kids were meeting that recommendation. So they're not even at 30 minutes. And they're no different than first graders. So really calling out, like, look and look at the girls versus boys. So something going on there. 
that I think, you know, you can say is it genetics, um, is something going on there, or is it really our culture and how we sort of treat boys and girls in terms of getting them to move an activity. Um, and I have children, both boys and girls, and I, I have to say that my two most active kids were my oldest daughter and my youngest son. My middle son, he was sort of the mellow boy. So, you know, I don't know if it's, you know, it's completely genetics there, but it is, you know, how we encourage them is, you know, pretty interesting. So compelling data and, you know, frustrating. So this work, all this tied together, so basically that Boston work on looking at this activity levels, and clearly more recently I'm looking at that as well, I did buy in to this exercise of brain food. Um, clearly there's food that we eat that helps our brains, but exercise is really stimulating to our brains. And if I can get it back to the schools and promote kids' health, I'm going to have to do it through standardized tests, academic achievement, behavior, attention to tasks. So those are the things schools will let me come back in if I still want to basically think about preventing obesity in kids and all the other related, you know, negative health outcomes go along with it. So you almost have to pick how you can, you know, what's your conduit to a means to an end um, to move your research forward. And I think a lot of you have probably seen this. So um, Chuck Hillman presented this work in a pediatrics article a couple years ago, and it's everywhere. And it's basically showing kids' brains on exercise. And what happens, um, a composite of 20 student brains taking the same test, and this was a group that was randomized to an after-school program that basically did, you know, quilting. No, I don't know. I, you know, basically your more academic tasks. And the other one on the right, those kids are randomized to a, a year-long after-school program that promoted physical activity. And then they had these same kids then sit, you know, after sitting quietly or after a 20-minute walk, and you can just see what happens to the neural activity in a brain after a walk. And I think we all know this, that we do pretty well um, in terms of paying attention to our work if we had a little bit of movement in our day. Um, so yeah, that's compelling, and that really gets, you know, um, school teachers, principals, superintendents, um, invigorated and interested in kids' health because that's what they're there for now is to get kids to be successful on their academics. Um, so this really was happening alongside um, the work that we were doing and led to another randomized control trial um, in schools funded by the NIH called the FLEX study, which is short for uh, the Fueling Learning Through Exercise Study. I like to think of it as physical activity, not exercise and not muscles, but FLEX was kind of cool and kids liked it. so. The little brain, you know, it's, it's kids. This is them picking their logo. So for us, it was like, how do we then sort of get physical activity in the day? We have key and recess, and we're not going to change that. But how do we add more activity for the kids? And this study randomized schools to two innovative school-based programs um, that were cheap and potentially scalable and replicable across many schools. And th these two programs actually were part of a nationwide competition, um, part of the Let's Move campaign with Michelle Obama. One started in um, Harlem, which was Let's Move, and one started East LA, East LA which is the 100 Mile Club. And schools are basically randomized to one of these two programs, which is not ideal. If you go into a school and say, look, do you want a this activity program? Like, you know, this one would work well for us. You know, you might be control. So it's, you know, we had a control group too, but this is what we did in third through fifth graders in 24 schools over two years, um, which is also a very long time to get engaged schools or any population. And the 100 Mile Club was the one that started in um, East LA, and this one actually encourages kids to run, walk, jog, crutch, wheel, whatever they can do, 100 miles over the course of the school year. So very easy to do. You try to get kids to do about three miles per week, and kids feel really, really good about this. To get 100 miles sounds huge to them. Um, schools have flexibility with the schedule. They can do it at part at recess. They can do before or after school. But it's adding minutes to the school day. You know, they're already low. Let's get them a little bit higher. And there could be indoor and outdoor loops. We had schools that had sort of, you know, lines throughout the schools, up and down the stairs to the cafeteria. You think about Boston. Um, the, the year that we started this randomized control trial, I think we had the 20 year blizz, 20 blizzards that year. So we, it was, you know, we had to be super creative and actually waited a year to randomize, randomize more schools because it was such an anomaly that winter. But, you know, obviously it works really well in warmer climates. And Chuck's just move was um, what you think about for active classroom breaks. Again, developed in Harlem, um, where kids don't have a lot of access to outside space. Um, and again, like you're getting a teacher to implement active classroom breaks. So a whole nother beast, right? Jen Sachek gets up there and she's like, okay guys, we want to exercise, but I'm not comfortable in my own body 
to get kids to move. So it's a, for some teachers, it's a barrier to get them to feel comfortable, but it can really engage kids to actually lead active classroom breaks, and it can be tied in with the Common Core standards, which is huge for a teacher. If you have to ask them to add something on to their curriculum, it doesn't work very well, but if you can tie it into what they're already teaching, it works great. But you can already see how it might be hard for um, those schools to take that pill, right? It's not just taking a pill, it's like you have to have a lot of buy-in from your staff. Um, so this is a timeline. We recruited schools probably, gosh, we worked on this for years to recruit all the schools in, um, pre-grant into the first year of the grant. Um, we had a baseline, and we wanted to look at short-term and long-term effects of these basic programs, because some schools might take it up really quick and have a huge response and then die off in the second year, and vice versa, it can be really hard to implement in schools, and it might take you know, a longer time. So we did a baseline at the beginning of the first year, a midpoint at the end of the first year, and then we did develop a whole other year later in these schools. So again, recruiting third and fourth grade kids in classrooms, and then following them through fifth grade, and that also coincides with um, looking at um, standardized test scores. So kids don't start taking those tests again until fourth grade. So we could look at basically changes in academic achievement. And we had, um, you know, they, sorry, from one, one um, we had groups randomized, and at each of those time points, we did demographics of kids, height, weight, diet questionnaires, we at diet quality, we looked at breakfast, because if you're doing academic achievement, you have to look at diet. So I had um, uh, PhD students um, work on some of that side of things. We have, um, actually at American Society for Nutrition, one of my doctoral students is presenting on the diet and cognitive piece um, and those relationships. Um, and obviously breakfast is really important. Did you eat breakfast, yes or no, is a very important question if you're gonna look at cognitive health. Uh, physical activity questionnaires, looked at social support, like how supportive are your peers, your teachers, your colleagues, um, and also your sort of self-worth when it comes to activity. Accelerometry for seven days, so we had all these kids do seven days of accelerometry at all three time points. Um, this fitness testing, we did a pacer test. We went in and ran the test this time. Um, my team was called the Barf Ladies because we did have one kid barf, like doing the pacer test. Um, but it was, you know, super fun to get some, I mean, some of these kids had never had a fitness test before. The PE teacher's like, well, I've never seen the kids so active. We're like, oh my God, you've never done a fitness test. And, but it's, it's crazy what you get in different schools. Um, cognitive function, we looked at a memory test, which is a digit span, and a true color word test, which is, you know, an admission test. Um, sat down with all the kids and did this. Um, also standardized test scores over the years, attendance, and then did kids participate in the program? Do they remember participating in their Just Move active classroom breaks, yes or no? So we wanted to look at intention to treat, but then we also wanted to subdivide into kids who actually really participated in the program. So um, with this all in mind, um, we did have um, just over a thousand kids who were randomized um, in this trial, and we had 18 schools, and we had a nice um, breakdown of third and fourth graders um, by sex. Really nice diversity with non Hispanic white being about 40%, similar to the Daily Needs study. Um, large Hispanic and black and multiracial population. Um, weight status, we did have, again, around that 40% overweight or obese and a very high percentage of free reduced life price lunch eligibility. Again, low income schools, the criteria was diversity and low income status. And we did find that their school time activity, as we had found in other, our other work, but 8.4% of kids are meeting the recommendation at baseline. And daily activity, about 20% of kids met that recommendation. So again, you know, at least the population that we got enrolled in the study was reflective of what we thought it would be. Um, the back one. Yep. You've got a pretty substantive college or some college, yeah. or college degree. Yeah. So that one. Yeah. So we actually put their low income status. Um, so oh, so there's also one community where we went for diversity over income. So some schools would be overall low income, but some schools would have a higher bracket of maternal education. Um, so if you look at pre so most of them were over 50%. So we want schools over 50% reduced price lunch eligible. And do they also do, in this set of schools, do they also do free breakfast? No, these schools did not do free breakfast. So none of the schools have that. Yeah, so that's not universal like it is here in DC public schools. So these were five different school districts. They weren't just one district across Massachusetts. 
And if you actually look at the uh, results of ALAD again, um, the hope was um, we would see a similar dose response of program over time, right? So we are looking at the same sort of kind of trial, but this time over two school years, and what would happen. Um, and you can see here, um, I would love to see the results. If you look at control, um, you're, you would love to see if it, it would be sort of, you know, Here's the recommendation of physical activity. The control, maybe the kids will get more active with age over time, you know, just because it's the right thing to do and they hear more. And the press or media, the teachers are buying in, the superintendents that physical activity is good. Um, you hope that just move, you know, it's active classroom breaks. It's not monitor vigorous activity per se. It's more likely to be sort of, you know, lighter activity, that they would still improve over time. And then the ultimate hope would be maybe, you know, 100 miles of light over, you know, supersede that recommendation and get to the level that you'd hope to over time and continue to improve over the two-year um, measurement period. So it's about a year and a half. Clearly, with this type of program, you're dealing with teachers, behaviors, and hope for uptake, right? Less control. And I think this just speaks to the beauty but also the messiness of working in populations um, in the community. And what we did see was the unfortunate findings that um, if you look at up top here, um, this is all case, I want to just focus on the all cases included. The participation adjusted did not have um, really significant differences. So in the manuscript that's under review, we didn't submit those per se, but we do talk about them. But what you see over time is that red is the control group, right? And so this first year, both all groups, basically they stay about the same in terms of their activity levels. So that's good they're not declining. But in that second year, you see what we see, you know, sort of cross-sectionally in multiple schools, you know, for cross-sectional data. The kids' physical activity levels are declining. So that's total daily activity. And if you look at the school time activity, that's a very similar finding. But what you do find, and it's so minimal, but we try to look at it as a positive win, that if you look at both Just Move and 100 Mile Club, pre to post, they are basically not changing. So mitigating the decline is all we can see in this. I mean, some can say that's awesome, they're not just declining. Some can say that's terrible, they're declining, and they're not improving. But even in community-based trials, large ones, um, large trials like Shape Up Somerville, where you do a lot of different things to sort of prevent weight gain, Prevention of weight gain is a win, right, instead of like decreasing obesity. So what I would say here is that you are doing one little thing and we got about two minutes of activity out of it um, across the board in multiple kids who may or may not participate on a daily basis. But we still have a huge way to go and it is really hard to do. So the Petri dish isn't as well controlled as we'd like. Um, and this is just sort of looking at the regression. So basically, it's the follow-up where it becomes significant. There's a prevention of decline by about two minutes um, in these kids. So this is controlled for clustering. We actually did other models. We controlled for the academic standing, so there's different tiers. So it's looking at the health of the school, the physical activity environment, all these different factors that can come into play beyond just, um, you know, the race, ethnicity, weight status, um, those sorts of things. We did look at reach um, of these programs. Do big kids buy into this more? Do different racial ethnic groups buy into this more? Or sex differences? There were no differences there by reach, which was actually a really good thing. In fact, I'd say anecdotally, um, these types of programs do really well for kids who aren't the fit kids. You know, we had a lot of we had a lot of groups of Latina girls who love walking at recess to try to get the 100 miles. So this was, you know, overweight kids. You know, that was very comfortable for them. So in our mind, the reach was a nice thing. And these papers are all sort of in press or under review as well. So really, there's forces beyond our control. And what you see if you look at implementation, and anybody who does this work, it's really important to do this implementation measurement, the process evaluation. But 59% of eligible classrooms actually did it on a regular basis. You know, you get a teacher to do something for one week, you get it to do it for six months, where they do it for two years. It's hard to say, and it was really tough. Um, some just didn't feel comfortable, right? And others just got bored. Or, you know, so these things in terms of being sustainable is something that we need to work on and also educate educators on. 
A 100 Miles Hub, only 34% of eligible children actually decided to do it. It's still a big chunk, but it's not all the kids. You can't force them to run or walk 100 miles over the course of the school year. But again, it's these little touches that if you add all these things together, can potentially make a big difference. So I say one program, just fixing PE or just fixing recess or adding one program is not going to change it. It has to be a whole host of things. So that is where my physical activity is still trying to catch up um, with um, the dietary aspect. Something as beautiful as diet, diet vitamin E, where you see a nice dose response. Um, but I do want to end with going into the summer um, and the work that we did do in the summer months in this study. Again, another PhD student um, just published her work on this. And I don't know if any of you guys know about summer weight gain in kids, um, but it's something, it's a, a phenomenon that happens. They typically gain a little weight over the summer months, and there's been a few studies that across the country in small pockets. Um, but looking at school year, sort of the rate of a change in BMI during the school year versus the summer, we did, did see elevated in these kids like we've seen in other studies. But what um, Lindsay Tansky tried to do is she actually tried to measure physical activity and diet in the summer. And if you ever try to do this with kids in the summer, it's really challenging. Uh, so we had a subpopulation come in, and what I'd like to say is that kids reported actually, if you look at their not so healthy dietary patterns over the summer, we'd assume like the salty snacks, the sweets, the sugar sweet beverages would all go up. We'd assume maybe even the fruits and vegetables would go up, but we saw all sort of a decrease in reporting of these um, dietary factors. There's weight gain in the summer. But what we did see is there's a decrease in monitor vigorous physical activity and an increase in sedentary time. And this is where I feel like physical activity needs a little bit more attention because the diet might not change necessarily for the worse. And of course, diet in kids is a whole other conversation, how you assess how to measure that. But people think summer is an active time for kids. And conversely, when you objectively measure it, it is showing that it is actually the opposite. So here's where physical activity may be catching up with nutrition and having a bigger impact than some of us would think. May not see it as much in adults, but we see a lot of it in kids in terms of having a huge impact on their health and the prevention of weight gain. So with that in mind, um, you know, always measure both if you can in any of your studies, and please don't just treat physical activity as a covariate in a model, um, but that's, you know, try to measure both, and I think they're both equally as messy to do, but um, especially in kids, uh, but, you know, I think there's some, you know, hopefully some new technologies that are coming out so we can do a lot better job with teasing out what's going on in a lot of these situations. So with that, um, lots of moving parts. Um, I like to say moving um, because of physical activity. Um, you know, and physical activity has a demonstrated, although frequently less emphasized, impact on children's health. So I hope we can all celebrate that. Um, and with that, I want to thank everybody who's helped me over the years, lots of um, graduate students and awesome project teams and awesome funding sources. Um, but, you know, it, it, it takes a village to do this type of work. So thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate any questions you have now. Thank you. So basically we were funded, they, so we had baseline data with one test, 
test. The next year, they're piloting a new test. And they decided they didn't like it, so the following year they had a modified test. So there, there are a lot of researchers working on all this data, right? So there, we're trying to all do it the same way in terms of how we approach being able to compare those data sets over years. So I don't want to say definitively, but I, I, I have not presented on it. But in terms of cognitive, there's a standardized test. There is some, yeah. So, but we're, yeah, I just want to wait to officially have that out before I can say definitively, yeah. Yep. I have two questions. Yep. Do, you, do you work at all with your CTSA? Because they're so community focused. Not really. No, no. So we. Not much we, chance to work with us. Yeah, I don't. So, yeah. so we just, you know, we had, um, we definitely worked a lot with, we had like a community, um, they call themselves something, is it independent that had the liaison? Yeah, but it, it is really, um, it is, for me, like even in DC, it's like those relationships, you, it's almost uncomfortable how gracious they've been so quickly. Like I feel like it's a, a relationship you have to nurture and trust. And I'm like, well, if I can do blood draws like there, now they'll let me do almost anything, you know, there. But yeah, so. And, and the other question is, is there, were you able to look at the sort of profiles of the teachers in these oh, yeah. schools? Yeah. In terms of, their, their characterization into these four groups, their um, sort of baseline biases about fitness and about diet yeah. and, and, and their answer. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So we, so I had a doctoral student who worked solely on teachers and they're like pre-K kids and teachers and even in DC we've done um, a physical activity survey, a diet survey, a job strain stress, so the decision latitude versus yeah. perceived, so that's huge in the job turnover rate. Um, but. We, they did a whole sort of wellness day, but these teachers, um, in general, we took, we went in and did some sort of in-classroom, you know, looks at things. They, I mean, on average, you know, one kid, four years old, say they're active, but we've never measured accelerometry. Sort of a good diet, but we had a bias sample of those teachers who actually responded um, to those inquiries, um, to those surveys. So they are, to me, they're the gatekeepers. And she actually also, the doctor student, looked at, you know, implementation of these programs based on teachers' physical activity levels. Right. Um, and, you know, because I'm like, it's, that's a sort of measure of their own health, you know, how they perceive them. Even if they perceive themselves as active and then they're not, they, they're, they believe in health, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, so that's exactly where I'm going. Yeah. So, so what do you think about that? Because we, we struggle with it. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, and for some of the things that we thought yeah. about. But it would seem to me that if you could get yep. over that threshold, that if you have a um, almost a randomized set of teachers, yep. then some you know really learn how to use the Fitbit, they were counting their steps, they were constantly yep. doing these things, yep. and the other were just you know in their normal yep. state, yep. and then looking to see because because it's all so multifactorial. Yeah, I, I, it's it's a it's, yeah it's a hot mess. Is what I say yeah. Um, I agree. I, I think that, and, and I, yeah, and I, there's actually um, another researcher in Kansas, for years he's done school-based work, and he said no one's funding teacher research, like, and, but they are who you entrust, it's like your, you entrust your physician, you entrust your teacher, right? And the amount of time, right, the kids spend with their teachers, and if they're not conveying sort of that health, and that, we looked at, you know, phys, uh, physical activity, um, teacher support. So in DC schools, we actually found that kids, only 50% of kids felt like their teachers encouraged them to be active, um, even though they said that they're really active resets, they're really, you know, so they they really noticed, I mean, that they didn't get as much as, you know, so that can be part of the problem, right? And not that it's the te poor teachers have to do everything, but I think their job strain and their lack of um, control over their days and their ability to engage in healthy behaviors, you know, it's, it's hard. And it's, yeah, I think there needs to be something more out there. And I I've talked to a couple of foundations about trying to find some of those too. Yeah. Book. Could be just out in in uh, so I was just at a meeting and um, this huge medical uh, enterprise yeah. and they give a thousand dollars off of your health care premiums, insurance premiums, yeah. if you are wearing a Fitbit, if you're overweight and you're doing an active program for this and the other thing. So I wonder for the teachers if there could be a benefit to yeah. this kind of well, gratification by by yeah. giving them sort of the the, sort of the wellness uh, angle of this. I, I feel like I am well even in DC schools and I don't know it well enough but I need to look into it more is you can't even give them a gift card, right? Yeah. Like so I mean even like I'm like can we do a national survey on teacher health and wellness? Can we give them a ten dollar gift card to you know wherever? 
And it's like some districts, I mean, Boston, we were lucky you, you could. You know, but I wish we would have done more. We were so focused on the key, you can only you try and do everything, right? Um, but here, you can't, I really, and we did get them to answer surveys. We have a couple, like what had only like 125 surveys that were, and we're still working on those, but they're a by sample. Like I'm like, if we could get gift cards, we could maybe get some that are, you know, <laughs> like a little bit more, but trying to figure out how we can get that in. So I feel like something needs to happen there. Um, and I, I think their awareness, like pre-K, and then those those are even, they're, you know, they get paid less, right? You know, they have lower um, bar for what they, education and what they need to be a pre-K teacher. Once they get the extra certifications, they just move up and they're an elementary school teacher. So those, and they're touching the kids already. And then I, yes, I get really frustrated by, and my mom's a teacher too, middle school. But, you know, I, I like, I, it's difficult everywhere. Yeah. So but I'd love to talk about it. Yeah. So as you were talking, having worked in D.C., public schools yeah. with some STEM education yeah. and finding that incredibly yeah. frustrating. One of the things that seemed to me is that I wasn't sure that you had enough carrots out there for for the teachers and for the kids. Um, so to be involved in the program. Okay, so this, this was an interesting long discussion we had, in, even in the, the pilot work. Because um, we did look at these programs and some pilot work uh, to look at sustainability, right? And it, and it was like, do you force it down their throat or do you make it more realistic in terms of what's going to happen in community? You offer a program. Ideally, you just go to a school that wants to get a program and they pick the one that they want and they'll best likely to implement. Here, we're doing, we're, but we're fighting with the NIH to do an RCT. So, but to force them to do it is what the school, the principal, the assistant principal bought into it, and we did trainings, we did weekly you know, emails, we did, the kids got a Target gift card for coming to all the assessments, like, we did focus groups on what the kids wanted for, you know, like, so, but to force them to do it felt um, more forced, right? Like, we wanted to be as natural an experiment as possible, given that it was already an RCT. But it's a very valid question, that, you know, that, so one of the ways that it would seem to me you might be able to have more carrots and sticks would be to work off of the whole issue of common core slash mm -hmm. nutrition slash STEM. Yeah, and that's the, the and one. to maybe turn some of your new work into science education partnership awards right. through uh, NIGM. Yeah. Uh, because then the teachers have their their carrots right, right. in that you're you're attaching right. a, a whole lot of common core standard check the boxes right. which they all need to do um, while you're getting the kids actively up and involved in heart rate measurement in you know I did this with my son's class <laughs> yes, I know yeah no, I agree that is this is like the first. Step. And then think about when this work was proposed, right? Um, and then, you know, during this time and sort of get that process in place. You, yeah, you have to fundamentally think about this, get all the architecture in place over the next couple of years, right, to then move it forward. But it is, it's trying to keep up with the players. I agree, it's a great next step, but this was more just, you know, can we even get the kids closer to meeting the recommendation? It was a simplistic, and is there an impact on cognitive health and academic achievement? And, you know, it's sort of that titration. Um, but to tie into education, I, I agree, yeah. And, and I was surprised that you were able to get the uh, the test scores because in D.C., that's going to be we had, yeah, such a bear. Yeah, yeah. we had so department education. Yeah. You could do it yeah. by class. We've had it by class, but not by individual. Yeah, so that yeah. was a, bit of a partnership that we established, we worked on in a couple of years working. Yeah, so complete craziness, yes. Hey, but, Two questions. One, um, in your first study, you know, you pivoted to concentrate on exercise, but you still got some nutritional information. Mm -hmm. And something that I think a lot about is the synergy mm -hmm. between the two. Mm -hmm. The kids without polyphenolic intake mm -hmm. or essential fatty acid mm -hmm. intake, you know, two fifteen and active yeah. nutrient categories are less likely to have the adequate mitochondrial function to really exert. Well, to exert yeah. and to enjoy it as much. I mean, it's like you, you, you literally get more work out of the same MVO2, yeah. right? Yeah. With, with a better fed metabolism. And vice versa, yeah. the kid has to work harder to exert the same yeah. amount if they're not well nourished. And you, you said you had 
That's we have, so, you know, know we, um, that, did that correlate with we did the, not even close um, to looking at that yet. Okay. Um, based on, we actually went to a simpler survey after the kids were doing the FFQ when we found that it was, they weren't given sort of the lower income, they were having a hard time with it. So we went to the, the more broader based questions. So fruits and vegetables versus other things. That's yeah. what we were seeing with cognitive, but we're not seeing it necessarily with this activity levels. But we haven't titrated down them. But we do have FFQs on, you know, first year or some other kids. Yeah. If you look at the pilot data. I appreciate your yeah. You know, calling out, you got to do both. Yeah, you know, yeah. Well, that's it. I feel like it still gets diced up. I'm like, okay, we have one paper where this diet is cognition, but we have this other, you know, it, yeah, and it's sort of, it's, to look, we have not synergized. I mean, that was, I'm trying to find a postdoc, so I'm was, hoping some of the synergistic stuff yeah, can yeah, be done in that part. Was yeah. there a link with cognition that? Yeah, yeah, that? yeah. And that can be presented. Is really in those categories of leafy greens? And it, yes, and exactly. It was, yep, yeah, exactly. So. Great. Yep. And then the last question, so many kids had elevated CRP. Yeah. Did that correlate with BMI? Because you did yeah. that stuff. But not, but not directly. Not directly. But it correlated, yeah. Okay. So, yep. So, yeah, I mean, it's just things you don't think you're going to find in a healthy population. I think that's well, what, you know, if you think clinic, yeah. There's so much. Yeah. Out there. Yeah. So, thank you for the question. Thank you for your time. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. That was so interesting.